Okay. Good morning. Morning, everyone. Does everyone sleep well? Yes. Okay. That's good. We're right at the beginning, so <laughs> people are having good rest. The gift of sleep. <laughs> Number 11. <laughs> it is a gift. <laughs> so you can have a fresh start to deal with what comes the next day. Yeah. Well, we have in mind too to um, have these sessions be very interactive and also extremely practical. So um, please remember that if there are emotions that start to come up that are very present, that's a, a good opportunity. Because a lot of us have just spent our whole life when emotions start coming up. Uh, we have a voice in our mind that says, keep it together, not now. Uh, there's important things you have to do. Don't get all emotional. You'll be dysfunctional, you know. Actually, that, that's like inhibiting our spiritual journey because our emotions are very much a part of our psychological makeup. They're, they're like our inroads to what lies beneath. And if we are constantly stuffing and denying our emotions and kind of getting off into intellectual tangents and talking about, instead of talking from what we're feeling, uh, talking about, can you imagine like, how funny it would be if you had uh, cats and dogs standing around in the yard having intellectual conversations? <laughs> you know, you probably would, you would just go, what's, what, what's happening to my dog, my cat? Like bubbles is very present, uh, very intense sometimes, but very expressive, but very present. And, and bubbles is here to remind us that that can be very important to have your emotions so close in awareness that they're accessible. And I've seen this more on a global scale because I have been doing enlightenment talks for 25 years. And I'll go to certain countries where there's so many layers of defense or so many layers of intellectualization and rationalization that there's really no tapping into emotions at all. It's like they've been completely squelched. And like in South America, you know, I, I would do enlightenment talks, self-realization talks, but generally people that would show up would be like 98% women, 95% women, 93% women in different countries like Argentina, Colombia, Venezuela. And it was the macho man phenomenon. Strong, silent type, don't ever show your emotions. It's really, it's not a male-female thing, but it's, I'll say this much, it's very inhibiting to spiritual growth if you are not in touch with your feelings. That's just a defense mechanism that the ego is using to protect itself and keep you caught up in minutia. Constantly talking about things, constantly telling stories, almost a chatter in the mind that's doing a running commentary on the world. Judging the world, judging the world, judging the self. Judging the self, you know, it's a way to stay on the surface of consciousness and prevent going deeper. Because the ego knows if you do go deeper, it's out of business. If you get underneath the emotions, you'll get into your thoughts, your cognition. There have been great psychotherapists like Albert Ellis who came up with RET, Rational Emotive Therapy, that help people get in touch with their emotions and then get in touch with their thoughts and realize that you can change your thoughts. And then you have significant changes, not just trying to change the behaviors on the surface, which can be enormously difficult. Anybody who's tried to let go of an addiction without getting deeper just sees it's hard. Behavioral change is extremely difficult. But it's even more difficult to change your thoughts, especially when you're not aware of them. How are you going to change them? So. We really want to keep this practical today, and if you start to feel in the session some, some big question or some big issue rising up, like thrusting up in your consciousness, this is the spirit saying, this needs to be dealt with, and this is a context, a safe context to 
to deal with it. And we're going in a new direction. You know, we've, we've tried denial and repression, many of us, most of our life, and some have had more the flip side of projection, where there's a lot of projection and, and blaming that goes on. I know that I think in the parable of David, that back in the teen years, that I was so much into shyness, denial, repression, that I would look at you know, your yearbook photos, like ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade, and my eyes were always half closed in the photos. Because it was a look on the face like, I don't, I'm not interested in the world and I'm not interested in the future. In fact, I don't want there to be a future. Nothing looks good about the future. It can be part of the shyness, depression, but also I would say that the defense mechanism underneath it is repression. I was really not in touch with my emotions. And I saw, how, with Jesus' help, how inhibiting that was during my 20s. And he said, you know, you're not going to advance spiritually. You can't really be in touch with me and where I'm going to take your mind if you don't get in touch with those emotions. So he took me to the movies, he took me to music stores, he knew that music and movies were ways for me to tap into those emotions in a safe way. I could cry in the movie theater. I could cry when I had my headset on and I was listening to some amazing pieces of music that the Spirit was bringing in and it was welling up all this emotion, like forcing it into awareness so that I could deal with it and be in touch with it. And, and as I said, I had a dog chipper for many, many years who was a, a safe symbol to let it out. So I cried a lot in front of my dog, and she licked a lot, and it probably saved me hundreds of thousands of dollars of psychotherapy money that I didn't have. Uh, but she, and I think it was probably more effective than psychotherapy, actually, because uh, I was able to move through the emotions much faster with that unconditional love and that sense of not being judged and being able to allow. So, yeah, I think we want to keep all this in mind for this session. Yes, it's, it's very important to actually allow whatever on the surface to, to be permitted and to not really judge it on top of what we're already feeling. Because, um, you know, sometimes when we have this beautiful glimpse or experiences with the spirit, if there is any thought like I can lose this and I don't know how to maintain and stay in this, it's always because we still perceive something just happened externally to us and it's because we haven't really get in touch with this force that's coming from within yet. And the, the reason is because that there's a habit of you know, not really turning in from within for, for all these answers. And all these answers are basically hidden by by all these emotions and the thoughts and the ego beliefs on top of, the, on top of them. So I guess for myself, it's just really um, the allowing myself to open up in terms of emotions is really the, the very essential first step. And after that, a lot of cleansing happens just as my day went, you know, things will come up and you allow anything that wants to come up to come up, whether with there is a reason to cry or not, but whatever um, shows up, we trust that is the orchestration by the spirit that the mind is ready to face them and is ready to release. But gradually what happens is there is a lot of clarity that starts to, to arise after all this cleansing that happens. And it de really helped developing this this confidence actually to start looking at the feeling, zooming in from the feeling into seeing how I feel every moment. Maybe for the first few years that how I f feel could be a lot of um, distortions, uh, a lot of negative feelings, but gradually when that all got cleared up, I started to feel a real sense of confidence that I can zoom into how I feel all the time to find inspiration. And the inspiration started to become more and more prominent 
in my mind. And that is where we, we will know that whatever that's guiding us and present this vibrancy in life will never get lost because it comes from within. And when you hold hand with that, that question of, I hope I don't lose my way will just never come back in the mind as a doubt thoughts. But it does it is like a habit that started to, you know, to form over a period of time to to really go in, inward, starting from the emotion. What what is that I'm feeling now and don't really judge it. It doesn't really matter what it is. And when we do our sessions in expressions or in anything really, it becomes our daily life. Um, whatever that has a very strong emotional component is normally the focus of our whole group because we know it's not really personal, it's not somebody specific issue, it's the mind and the mind, it, you know, instead of all these other um, trying to talk about certain things, there is one person that is bursting with emotion and that is the mind that that is ready to burst. So we actually put that as a priority over anything else. Okay, let's come together and resume into this particular thing that wants to come up and be talked about and be looked at together. So I guess um, this retreat will be the same and any session we do will be the same. If you feel there is something in your heart that just wants to burst and you want to cry or you want to explore certain things, don't hold back and think it's just I'm taking too much time or um, other people's issues are more important. No, this is the most important because it's going to benefit everyone, the whole universe. Yeah, there's a website that we have called levelsofmind.com uh, that, that not only has these, we'll call them levels or concentric rings that I got from Jesus of the outer perceptual world on the outside and then the emotions underneath and then the cognition and thoughts underneath the emotions <coughs> and the beliefs underneath the thoughts and then the desire is the core, your prayer, your desire, your point of power underneath. Uh, that that really is everything else springs from our core desires and the power of the mind. So Jesus gave me that as a way of kind of navigating. I I've been in psychology and ten years of university, and then it was like I I really was very visual in many ways. So I said I need some graphics here, Jesus. What's going on? And and uh, and then the miracle is more like a slice through all of those levels. Of, of an inspiration from spirit that kind of straightens out perception and, and comes straight through from that desire and, and reflects all the way through all the levels, all the way out into rearranging perception even. Uh, that's what miracles do, they rearrange perception and they bring everything back into the divine order where you feel harmony at one with everything. So, we also have a, a tool called Instrument for Peace that's part of that, so that not only do you get this structural thing that helps you, but it, it's also you get a 12-step thing that takes you from your perceptions of interpretations down deeper inside into your core expectations and then underneath that to your desire that things should be different than they are. That's what the ego is, a desire that things should be different than they are. Things would be better if only this was different. See how different that is from let all things be exactly as they are, or allowance and acceptance. So, one thing I wanted to talk about, because Francis brought up this idea of loss, that way down in the mind, underneath all these levels and layers, there's this sense of tremendous sadness and loss from believing of separation from God. It's like the loss of your beloved. And in this world, you know, that's very stressful and very intense when you seem to lose someone, whether it's a pet or a partner or a family member or a close friend, a neighbor. There's this sense of loss and the mind that believes it's a person is pretty rocky. It doesn't really have a strong foundation. I mean, the persona, the personality is just a mask 
and the mask is teetering. And the mask takes an enormous amount of effort to keep up. Uh, that's why there's so much anxiety and strain is keeping the mask up. And Jesus is really encouraging us all to drop the mask and trust that it's going to be, all will be great if we drop the mask. The ego says, all will be chaos <laughs> if you drop the mask, because the ego made the mask. And the ego wants something to protect itself from being uncovered. So there's a tremendous sense of loss that's deep down. And earlier we were just talking about how important it is to get into the emotions and, and get in touch with that so you can go deeper. The ego doesn't want you to get in touch too deeply with the emotions because then you'll start to see that you have a lot of conflicting emotions. Yes? the now, but I also hear you say if I'm unhappy with the now, I must talk about it. Yes. Now, I'm very unhappy with my now right now, and I had just this beautiful sharing session, and I feel all alive and loving and connected with the people, and then something here happened, and now I'm so upset. And I feel so happy because it's only about where I'm sitting. What does it bloody matter where I'm sitting? Doesn't matter who's next to me, doesn't matter if I sit the first row, back row, I have this idea, I can concentrate better in the first row, I want to be at the front, I, I like to have my boyfriend next to me. He was actually going to sit here. And I thought, and then I started changing things, you know, would have been so perfect if I had just let everything be. He would be sitting here, I would be sitting here, happy days. No? I had in my mind, it would be not much nicer, he said, here, yeah, because I'm always like blocking this person a little bit. So, he said, here, yeah. <laughs> then this woman comes, and says, well, I don't know where to sit, or something like that along the lines. I said, oh, you can be, like, just sit here. So, she reluctantly sits there. Then, two min one minute later, somebody comes and says, you two cannot sit here. And I go in shock. Why? No, it's perfect. <laughs> no, Mel and... Michael, Michael must be sitting here. Mel is not actually even sitting here. So. <laughs> <laughs> this is good. This is like a synopsis. This is making my point. This is making my point that when you have expression sessions, you start to move in a new direction where you let the emotions up. And why haven't we done it in the past is because it seems unmanageable. How am I going to function in daily life? If I start letting my emotions up, how's that going to affect my relationship with my boyfriend? How will that affect my career, my job? I went through the same thing even when I was in grad school and I started, you know, getting into the Course, course in Miracles and I thought, I love the feelings of, oh, happy, happy, joy, joy, but the, then all this other stuff gets stirred up, and it's like, that could affect my, my grade point average. That could affect my everything, my relationships. And then when it really starts to come up, when you really allow that, then you think, I'm going to be totally dysfunctional, and, and I might lose everything that's dear to me in this world, because I'm an emotional basket case, and I can't handle that. And, you know, some of you might remember Jack Nicholson in the movie A Few Good Men. You can't handle the truth. Well, in many ways that's what the humans are dealing with. They can't handle the truth, divine love, and they can't even handle the emotions that are covered on top of all that divine love. So it does take a lot of faith, and, but we're saying just open up and say, okay, I'm safe here, I can talk my thoughts, I can go through these emotions, and this is all part of my healing process. Nothing's going wrong, it's actually going right. Because we're starting to get, it, your emotions start bobbling and you feel more schizophrenic. But you have to, Louise Hay once time said, it's, spiritual healing is like, is like we have a, a, a holiday in the United States called Thanksgiving where they have a big turkey, you put in a turkey, you put it in a pan and you cook it for hours and then you serve it and then at the end you've got this greasy, grimy, baked on turkey pan that's got a crud on it. And Louise Hay uh, said, 
the, the spiritual healing is very much like cleaning a turkey pan that's there. You've got to put the water in, and you've got to put all the soap and detergent in, and you've got to scrape and scrape and scrape and let it sit and scrape some more and let it sit. And she said the water will get a lot more dirty before the pan gets clean. Yeah. And that's, I thought, wow, Louise, that's fantastic. That is a good metaphor for this journey, that it's going to seem to get messier. But it's also important to remember that we're safe. That's why we are here, supporting and nurturing each other. This is not corporate, you know, world. This is not a place where there's the family, and if you start to be emotional, you may rock the boat. Like, uh, John Bradshaw was a family counselor for many, many years, decades. I remember watching him, and he described his childhood family uh, and I thought, he's talking about my family. <laughs> and he was joking, he said, they could have said, grab it, there's a feeling loose in the living room. Because <laughs> there was so much, you could not talk about feelings. You could talk about the weather, you could talk about the sports, you could talk about the current events. You couldn't say, I'm feeling something, and be like, a look, like, oh, dare you, man. There's a, grab it, there's a feeling loose in the living room. Uh, because there's such a, a systematic suppression of feelings. So, thank you. That was a great contribution. And if, if you feel, if anybody feels to, to switch and let Ross sit next, on your right hand side, if that helps, you want you want to be close, but you also want Ross on your right hand side. We might have to see if anybody feels it. I don't know, but it's a good contribution. David, I was, sorry, I was just wondering, could we? Uh, what is the deep down belief under under? You know, we, sorry. I'm just wondering if we could sort of examine the deep down belief yeah. because, yeah, with the circles of minds, I, um, yeah, I get, yeah. Yeah, I mentioned it earlier. I, yeah. I said the ego is the wish that things be different than they are. Yeah. So, and she perfectly demonstrated that when you were saying about you had this kind of feeling like, oh, it's wonderful, I'm close, and it would be nice, and Ross sitting to my right, and this, and then all of a sudden, these characters started to fill in, and, <laughs> and that unconscious belief, that a wish that things be different than they are, got stirred. Mm -hmm. And there was anxiety. There's a feeling of, of anxiety and, and emotion. Yeah, and also, I'm blaming him, also. <laughs> And that's what happens. That's the second part. That's the blame. That's how the ego handles it. Something's not right, and, and such and such is the blame. That's, there it is. You're you're showing the whole. <laughs> I'm like instead of finding solution of pain, because I said, oh no, I cannot upset this woman. She will want to sit at the front. I don't actually know. Maybe she doesn't even care because she was very handsome. <laughs> there were so many other ways. I could approach it, so then I was annoyed with myself that I was so limited and making, mm. I don't know what actually, but I then started being unhappy with myself. And yeah, it's very, the Course has one line that people relate to, would I rather be right or happy? And what it is, is would I rather be right about the way that the ego set up this entire cosmos, or would I be happy? It's not right about really a specific form, that's just the tip of the iceberg. The ego set this world up as a projection of guilt, as a projection of anger, and the ego therefore is saying, oh, things need to change. It would be like if you went to a movie theater and you were watching the movie and you started to get upset during the movie. And you got up out of your movie theater seat and you walked down to the screen and you started pounding on the screen at the movie theaters. Stop! And sometimes people don't do that. They don't get actually up and pound on the screen, but they will sit there in their chairs. And when Julia Roberts is walking down and the, and the bad guy is around the corner, people call out, Don't go down! That's Julia! Stop! You, know, you see, they, it's just a bunch of shadows on the screen, but they're like, Don't! Stop! Stop! They're squeezing their husband, Stop! You know, because, because they've forgotten that it's a movie. <laughs> they've forgotten it's just a bunch of shadows, and they're actually in 
feeling fear for a character, and that is a good metaphor again for the dynamics of how we forgot that we're asleep, we forgot we're dreaming, and we forgot that we're projecting, and, and therefore when we feel upset, our first tendency with the ego, the ego speaks first, is to blame something, or to try to rearrange something on the screen. And this whole idea of getting in touch with the emotions is the first step of letting that go. Because it's a very dysfunctional uh, attempt, it's a defense mechanism. Yeah. Okay, that's good. that's exactly what we talked about. Thank So I have a sense of failure, not about this. Um, <laughs> I'm very happy here, as I see. <laughs> um, so I have a sense of failure. So is that because I'm just not accepting the way things are? It's like I'm judging the situation. I feel a failure of... Well, I'll, I'm going to state it very bluntly. Um, <laughs> it's really hard. <laughs> Um, I, my marriage broke up in 87 and I can't say that I formed another committed relationship in that time. I've had other relationships but nothing of substance. So that's 30 years without being in a committed relationship. And I judge that and feel a failure. I feel, what is wrong with you? Why can't you form... And I can go back and say, oh, well, look, you were probably too hurt or you were very judgmental, you, you know, you've got to change yourself, you've got to improve, and that's the failure, I've got to improve myself, why haven't you been able to manage this? Because I have a vision in my mind that this is a good and um, constructive way to live, a joyful way to live. Why have you, and I blame myself, deprived yourself of this opportunity? Why? And so there's the failure. So, so in terms of and I have been a student of course principles for 27 years and I still haven't come to the answer. It's like I, I keep working on the course and thinking somehow it'll all evolve in the way I want it. So yeah, there's the good. failure. There's the failure. It's like, well, you just didn't work hard enough. You didn't do the right thing. Get it, girl. Get it. You're not another... I'm a relationship therapist as well. I'm a family therapist and, and I work with couple counselling. So how much more? It's like the very thing I aspire to is the very thing that slips away from me. So, oh, that's beautiful though that yeah. you're sharing this. Because as we were talking about yesterday with the idea of, of sickness, that it's from all illness is mental illness. And, and the, the problem of this world is and, and, and again, healing will occur the instant there's a recognition that it's the, the mind and not the body that's the decision maker, but the idea of persons making decisions in their life and taking responsibility, personal responsibility for those decisions is so deeply ingrained in your profession, in all professions of the world, in all perspectives of the world, that it doesn't seem to be so clear that that when you are are judging these the relationships and the way things have gone and the decisions that you personally have made there's still a projection of this decision making to the person to the body mm. and what i mean by that what's the alternative like with the, with the course if you've been studying for 27 years the alternative, and I'm because I can't master that too. <laughs> yeah, and then adjust the judgment around that. Yeah. What I've discovered is, uh, through all this practice of the Course and, and these miracles, is that Jesus is the one who made it through time and space and transcended. That's why he's the way, the truth, and the life. That's why he's the author of the Course, this great pathway back to eternity. But he also says that, that he says, I can arrange time and space, meaning he says that if you will be a miracle worker for me, I will arrange time and space for you. He, arranged, he arranges relationships, he arranges jobs, he arranges when you start jobs, stop jobs. He, he is behind everything. In fact, we could say that the Course teaches that when the separation seemed to occur, that the Holy Spirit answered it simultaneously. Mm -hmm. So the entire plan of what we consider time and space, which seems to go on for millions of years, 
all was simultaneously planned mm. in one instant mm. and spun out in one instant, all seeming lifetimes. Every single encounter, every relationship, every meeting, every breakup, mm. every new meeting, holy encounter, everything was all arranged in one instant. Mm. And Jesus is orchestrating that and might say everything has a purpose underneath it. So we're never really making a mistake in anything. And yet the ego has us believing we're making major mistakes all the time. So that was actually what I sort of thought I clicked into before. And as I said, so why do I feel this failure? Because really what you seem to be saying, there is no failure. It's just following the path of your learning. Yeah. There is, um, I think the feel, feel your feeling comes in when you think you're missing out on something. There's a sense of loss that actually ties up to mm. what you were saying. Like, there's something that what I'm doing or what I'm having, I miss out on something. And this is not, this is not the fullest that I can have. Yeah. Yeah, yeah Jesus, he didn't describe that in the manual for teachers, where he says, in, in reality... There are no levels of relationship at all. But he knows that the mind believes in separation, so he, he gets three levels. Uh, I think you turn your mic off. Is there a switch on? There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff calls it. Uh, so he says, but here's three levels because you know because this is what you believe in: a casual encounters, and then fairly te intense teaching, learning relationships in which they appear to separate, mm. but learning is always maximal. Mm. Those are great words. Mm. I mean, I remember when I first was going through that, appear to separate, but the learning is maximal. Whew, I felt a release of guilt just from hearing those <laughs> words. And then lifelong relationships, more of mm. like you were talking about, committed mm. lifelong relationship. But he's just giving those kind of as stepping stone things that the mind can kind of relate to. But he's saying, actually, everything's always maximal. And you're always in the right place at the right time. And nothing in form is ever going wrong. Ever. That all things work together for good. That's a line from the Bible. The Bible, in the Bible it says, all things work together for good for those who love the Lord. Okay. In the Course, Jesus says, all things work together for good. There are no exceptions, except in the ego's judgment. Ooh, that means there must be a divine order in everything that's playing out. You mean world wars are somehow in divine order? Dropping bombs over Nagasaki and Hiroshima was part of a, a greater plan? Yes, everything that seems to occur can be perceived from a higher perspective. And it's, it's, there's a, a, a divinity that's from this higher perspective where you, you just see things simultaneously and as in, in an order where everything's in harmony. Everything's in absolute harmony. That's the goal of spirituality, is to reach that harmonious perception. So as you're speaking... So I could actually live this very same situation and be totally joyful if I could just accept this is my way? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, what I'm saying is, is the, the personal perspective, when you are judging yourself mm. with the coulda, woulda, shoulda's, and oh, I wish how I did this and I haven't had that since I did this and all that stuff that's going on in the mind. I'm not getting it yet. I'm not getting it yet. Those are all personal judgments. It's, it's like a clinging on to a small personal self. Yeah. Meanwhile, there's a higher self that's saying, come on, come on up here. We're above the battlefield up here. It looks great. The view is spectacular up here. And that is the goal of self-realization is to come up, we'll say, more to the dreamer of the dream, which is where the happy dream is. And it does take practice, but you might say that it's these habitual judgments of the things could have been different. You know, you're, uh, both of you are tremendously bringing us examples of, of that wish that, ah, I would, things would be better off, I would be happy if things were different. And you've just filled in the standard of if I had 
a, okay, it's all right, I got divorced. Okay, that's fine. But <laughs> if I'd had another long-term relationship to come in after that, somewhere along these last... In 30 years. In 30 years, it, then, then that would have been better than the way that it played out. Yes. Or you were saying if, if the configuration in the front row was, was different, uh, I would be happier now if there was a different front row configuration. But those are both good examples. One played out over 30 years and one played over 30 seconds. <laughs> uh, but the show is the time is not a factor here. It's something that's much deeper. Yeah. So how, so the question is then, how do I just sit and wait to get out of the dream? Or how, you know, because in a way it's like, do I just, because there's that other part of striving for me to get out of the dream. Because again, I see the judgments, I see what I'm doing, but I sit there doing it. And there's something I feel I need to do to stop it, to stop going around in this circle. You can talk about function, that's, that's <laughs> where function comes in. Yes, and also um, with this sense of relationship, because I noticed Jesus has this... Uh, um, saying in the Course that future loss is not your real concern, but present joining is, is your dread. The, the fact that you know we are craving for a long-term relationship on a linear timeline with a one person mm. is thinking you know this particular person can fulfill something that I'm missing or I'm lacking right now. Mm. And the, th the fact is, anyone who has been in, in a long-term relationship, either with an intimate partner or with family or friends, we know that there is still something that's unfulfilling unless we learn how to truly use the relationship to fulfill a bigger function than just um, give me the specialness and I give you what you need, you know? Mm -hmm. So the fact is, the A Course in Miracles is a, a pathway through relationships. And we, Jesus is wanting to use relationships to pull us higher and higher. And yet we have to allow the relationships to be transfer, transformed in our mind of how to relate, basically, how to really use relationship for a much higher purpose, for awakening. And these relationships, like David said, is not based on our decision. They are given moment to moment, and sometimes they're given over a longer period of time with one person, one body, and sometimes they're, they're given all throughout the day with different faces. And as long as we still think love can only happen with one particular face dragging out, then we miss out this chance of of allowing this relationship in this moment to serve the same purpose. So then a question comes in of how to really open us up to use every single encounter for the one same purpose. You know, if, if the purpose becomes unified, with that doesn't matter who comes into my awareness or to my day, I have the same purpose as someone come to my life to marry me, then when the purpose becomes unified, the, um, the feeling of the difference will start to fade. Are they really different in any way if I use them in exact the same purpose? So the question is then how to, your question is what I need to do, what is my part in this? And that's a great question to ask. What is my part in in using what is given by you to serve because your I plan? I have a wealth of relationships. And I've met, you know, through my counselling, I've met so many people and shared so many lives. And I have my children. I have my brothers and sisters. I have my... I have a very rich life in people. Yeah. So, it, But it's still that sense of... And I understand what you're saying. Every face is an opportunity for... Spirit. I do understand that. But then there's something more that I'm still not reaching. And, it's, and I don't think it is only one partner. It's, there's something, some dimension. I think it's what you call realising the dream. And 
rising above the dream. And it's like that's where I'm stuck. I can't seem to get out of the dream. Yeah. I think the, the thing is also comes back the relationship, um, including the daily relation. Uh, the daily random encounters and those more stable, seemingly committed relationships mm. and our function are not really different because, you know, as we get more and more in touch with our inspiration, it, we are getting in touch with the function that Jesus is wanting us to fulfill. Seemingly, as we still walking this planet Earth, we are given a function and being used by Him as a communication device, and play a particular role in the plan of awakening. It can look in different forms and ways, but you know when you click into that. For example, in your profession, you know when you give over those sessions to the Spirit and allow Him to use you, there is a great sense of fulfillment, and. The relationship is really not separate from from function because every single relationship is is you know plugged into the bigger function, including intimate relationships. You know, if if we give over our intimate relationships and and marriage and daily encounters to say what is the function to you know. To levitate my mind higher, to give this over to you, and use that to get in touch with how I feel more, to get in touch with my tra- um, true, honest feeling, and learn to be transparent with someone that is in front of me, and learn to listen to you, to pray together, to hear what you have for us, and truly giving over the relationship to Him. Then every single relationship becomes an extension and becomes a way to fulfill our function, and that is going to make the relationship extremely fulfilling, but also be, make the relationship very, very purposeful. So this, the question of this doesn't really、um, give me what I want, and I hope that particular form will come in, will start to fade off very gradually, because I. You know, we have just so many examples of how Jesus Jesus will orchestrate the relationship. Sometimes they guide people together. Sometimes they break up a relationship if it serves the awakening better, serves the mind to go higher better. So every single coming、uh, coming together or going away is always because this is the maximum. Way to serve the mind, to serve his plan, and to serve the mind to actually go higher. It's always because of that one reason. I think we have to remember too that it's it's the thinking, it's the categorizing, it's the stereotyping, it's the, it's this breaking things apart mechanism in the mind that's the problem. That the ego is always fragmented. It made up a fragmented world, and it's always categorizing. That's where analysis comes in, and that's where all this diagnosis comes in, and fixing comes in. It's it's very much a, a dysfunctional thought system. So, the answer is, <clears throat> it has to be a, a higher order of thought that lifts us up back to the harmony.、Um, Einstein said, "You know, you you cannot solve a problem from the level of the problem. You have to rise above the level of the problem, the, where the problem is perceived, to the answer. You can't find the solution at the level of the problem." That was amazing mind, amazing scientist. Jesus is saying the same thing. He's saying, "You have a perceptual problem, so as long as you try to make things better and fix things at the level of form." You're not going anywhere. You're just like spinning your wheels like a hamster, going round and round, and there's no progression whatsoever. But when you do let go of that category thinking, you know, this is like this. Men are like this. Women are like this. You know, all those the learnings of differences. When you do let go, then you find yourself coming into peace. How you do that is you. Realize that the ego has developed many skills, and even your counseling skills were part of a skill development, a skill set development. 
But those skills won't help you unless the Spirit is using them. In other words, the Spirit can ch channelize all our seeming separate skills. Maybe we have skills driving a car or a truck, or mm -hmm. counseling, or in building, or in gardening, or in cooking, or in all kind of athletic skills, so on and so forth. But they're all fragmented. And we feel more like the Scarecrow in The Wizard of Oz, where all of our straw is out all over the road. Remember when the, was it, the flying monkeys come and they pull all the straw of the scarecrow and leave it all over and his friends gather the straw and put, it, put him back together. Well, that's what the Holy Spirit's doing with our fragmented mind. It's, it's unifying and using all the separate skills and channelizing in one direction, which we'll call forgiveness or healing, so much so that, as Francis was saying, we don't start to think, oh, these are my relationships over here, and this is my occupation over here, and this is my household over here, and here's my family over here. You see, all those different, like a scrapbook of separation, mm -hmm. and we're needing to be unified, we're needing to give over all those things to the Spirit, and say, take me in another direction, where I can see the sameness in everything. I can feel that agape love with everyone and everything. So you know intuitively that there's another step you have to go. You're in touch with that, and that's part of what this... And if I could name it, it is to hand it over to the Holy Spirit. Yes. And that's where I balk. And yeah. that's where I've balked for many years, I think. Control, it's like there's a control yeah, thing, like, that's whoa. that's the issue, that is the ultimate issue, <clears throat> sort of... I'm no longer practicing because I've retired, and that is good. Because I know that I was in a mode of intellectual being. I have the opportunity to hand it over to the Holy Spirit now. You know, I feel, before I was afraid to let all the strands go. And now it's just a choice, and, and it's just me that would have to live with the consequences. Um, and that's where I feel I'm at, and that's, that's, I think that's the real fear, to, to step into the Holy Spirit and to live. So that, that is, by talking about it, it's like I could see all these various strands, but I couldn't get to the point, but I can see how they're linked now. It is that, it's not the partner or the family, it's the choice for the Holy Spirit. Yeah, and the, again, there's, to the ego there's a fear of loss, like it feels yeah. it had the reins, yeah. and it doesn't want to let go of those Well reins. I'm scared of, it's like falling into an abyss, I've had that feeling before, it's like there'll be nothing there, there'll be just all that I know can fall away, yeah. the children. It's the unknown. Yeah, the it's absolutely the unknown. unknown. Yeah. Yeah, and it's um, and it feels like I'm on the brink, and it feels like I've got to jump, but now I don't even know how to jump. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah. It's beautiful that you're in touch with that, though, because even if we looked at the world, we say, why do we have laws in the world, and why do we have prisons, and why do we have judicial systems, and all these things? And so if you talk to somebody on the streets, like, why do you have all this? They would say, well, the reason we have prisons is because if we had criminals uh, running around all over the place and people breaking the law with no consequences, then without all these rules, all would be chaos. Meanwhile, in our mind, Jesus is saying, if you give up all the rules and trust me, all will be love. So you see there's two different perspectives of giving these rules up. One is saying all would be love, and the other one is saying all would be chaos. <laughs> Fear is saying all would be chaos without the rules. And there's something in us that knows this isn't natural. This isn't the way I was created to be bound by all these rules and regulations. And the ego says, you have to deal with it. All would be chaos without it. So. So you're getting to that point, it's like a jumping off point of being willing to trust the Holy Spirit, go beyond the familiar, 
Because the form of love I'm a ter- it feels, feels like I don't think I'd understand that love. I don't think that love would feel very cosy. <laughs> I think that love sounds pretty frightening. It sounds pretty, oh God, I might have to live with people I don't want to live with and I might have to, you know, oh, like I know my life. <laughs> I know people have said, they have listened to me and they said, you know, you keep talking about the kingdom of heaven like Jesus did, but they said, frankly, it, the kingdom of heaven sounds boring. Exactly, exactly, exactly. <laughs> And I have to say, well, it's not. <laughs> it's not That's my, what I'm frightened of. It's not my experience. But, but from the, you have to see from the ego's perspective yeah. that, that heaven or nirvana is going to involve a huge sacrifice mm. of, of its world. And that's the whole thing. The reason its world was made was to block love out completely and have a complete amnesia. So that's what we mean by faith. When you go on this journey, you have to be willing to let things that seem to be safe and comfortable and convenient and safe, let them go. Yeah, I have a nice life. <laughs> exactly. That's, I hear that all over the world. You know, yeah. People will say, uh, to me, I'm glad you're living that life. <laughs> I like watching you on YouTube, but... Yeah, exactly. I, I'm inspired. It's like... Yeah, it, and I did have a vision of... At, when I was 16, of, of sort of what... I understand it's possible. I lived that joy when I was 16 and let it pass away. I, I let, it didn't compute with me, so I forgot it until I turned... till my divorce, actually. So it's like I've had premonitions of what it is, even before I understood and read any literature, I had an experience of total bliss, total acceptance that everything was as it needed to be, all the wars, all the cancer, all the terror, was absolutely as it needed to be, and I still struggle to accept it, but I lived that experience when I was 16, and so I know the joy and the bliss that it can be, but I'm still afraid to step there. Yeah, most people feel like they've they had some sparkles of a great experience when sometimes when they were younger or glimpses, but they got somehow hooked into a life of compromise, like living by making a lot of compromise no, decisions. I wanted to do certain things. I wanted to have certain experiences. I can actually know that I didn't want to go. I wanted to live a life, have a family, have children, yeah. have a career, travel the world. It played out. House. Yeah, I you, knew I wanted to. Yeah, you it. wanted it, but now it comes a point. It's not so much a regret, but it's more of a point. Like, is there more? Well, I know there is. And you know there's more, but the thing about it is, I meet a lot of people who are very comfortable with their earth lives, the status quo. It's very comfortable. It's very familiar, and their version of spirituality is watching Julia Roberts act out, eat, pray, and love. They like to go to the movie, plunk down $20, watch her go through the experience and go, Phew, that was intense. Glad that's not me. <laughs> that's the spiritual journey, going to watch Eat, Pray, and Love. Well, that was two hours. Thank God I got that over with. Now let's get back to some more distractions. You know, they, it, it's, it's, you know, they, they want it where they can just spend the money and they're back in control. You yeah. see, it's all right if Julia Roberts has got to go through all these intense emotions. He left her? You know, <laughs> it takes you ten minutes. Okay, it's over. just a movie. <laughs> God, I'm not going to go there. You see, that's what we're dealing with. We're being called by the Spirit to actually go through a, a transformation. And we're like, me? Now? <laughs> it, it, no. <laughs> hey, her. Him. But then you have to start to face these emotions that come up. So, and they are intense. I know this. I should stop. But I just want to own, as much as I have a nice life, there is a lot of fear and anxiety that just sits beneath the surface. Like, so it's there. And that's what I know. That's the search for peace. So the search for peace is to deal with that fear and anxiety. Because I don't believe the life... I know it's not... It has no substance in the end. I know that. It has no substance. I know it. So I, I don't know why I keep talking, because it's just about doing something. And then I get frustrated with myself. Stop talking. 
I think if you just pray the prayer, like if you mm. take it off of your personal self and you say, Spirit, I just need help with this. I do. <laughs> and, and out of my Movie Watcher's Guide to Enlightenment, a lot of our movies involve character transformation where two people are brought together and it seems like unusual circumstances and there's a tremendous healing and undoing that goes just by like an answer to a prayer. There's a movie, I think it's called is it The Untouchables, uh, with uh, in France, uh, where there's in touch, Untouchables, where there's a man who's in a wheelchair and he's quite wealthy, and then there's this this black man that, that comes to like apply. He's he just is trying to survive. He's got more of a survival mentality, and this is based on a true story. I mean, nothing's really true in the world, but in terms of of that, and they come together and and. They're still friends today. You know, this movie was made about their life, but they still stay in touch. A tremendous, trusting, loving, deep relationship came, and there was tremendous undoings that happened. Mm -hmm. and, it, and we love those kind of movies. That's how it gets into our movie, Watcher's Guide to Enlightenment, because people don't know their own best interests. You know, that's a good place to start, too. That's an early workbook lesson. You know, I do not perceive my own best interests. Mm -hmm. That's humbling. Oh, that's so humbling to say, I do not perceive my own best interests. And it's more humbling when you, Jesus says, in no situation, not in some situations, in no situation do you perceive your own best interests. People have read that and said, now come on, <laughs> oh, who, do you, who do you think you're dealing with here? <laughs> I mean, you, you, no situation, zero. And then he goes on in the next lesson to say, uh, that everything is is for your own best interest. We're back to all things work together for good. Everything that seemed to occurring is completely in our own best interest. And it's only the ego judgments that say, oh no, oh no, you made a mistake. <laughs> you have a plan, you say it's complete and all perfect, oh no, you messed up here. But see, that's the ego, and, and that's the part that needs to be undone. So you're trusting. So just, yeah, just pray the prayer, that's all. All you do is pray the prayer. And I mean, the funny thing was, you know, I had a group one time in uh, Mallorca, it was a, a devotional, and I was talking with them, I said, well, if you really are feeling that you want to have major transformation, just say, Holy Spirit, bring it on. <laughs> and I said, but be very careful if you pray this prayer. Holy Spirit, bring it on for the, for the healing. Well, we got to a certain point where I told that, and then I went into the session, and one person said, Holy Spirit, bring it on. And then another hand went up and said, Holy Spirit, bring it on. And then the whole group, as a group, Holy Spirit, bring it on. Oh my, was that a, a transformational Week. They, we had a woman who came in there with, diagnosed with cancer. She didn't have cancer when she left there. We had people who went through major transformations where they felt like, I'm not even the same person. And where do I go from here after six weeks? And, and saying with their fist in the air, sometimes both hands in the air, Holy Spirit, bring it on. I'm going to say it. Holy Spirit. Okay. All right. All right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that. Oh, yeah. That's it. <laughs> she said, her prayer is Holy, bring, Holy Spirit, bring it on for six days. <laughs> that's a lot. People don't realize that's a, that's a lot right there. <laughs> Yeah, it, I think we're all here together. It's just wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. It makes it worth sharing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. We have our microphone coming back. Um, I think I might opt for a partial transformation. <laughs> <laughs> Could you make a comment about that, please? <laughs> 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 
Well, even though there, there really isn't a sense of partial healing, you know, that's, that's one of these made-up ideas. Also, we can say that, that Jesus tells us, you know, you will not be hurled into reality. In other words, miracles were built into the wake-up plan so that uh, there will be, a, there will be a, a reinterpretation of the world, but not a sense of dis destruction, a sense of dis think, catastrophe, a sense of, of, of complete disillusionment, that, that miracles are built in to this plan of awakening to take us generally on a, we'll say, a gradual awakening, because it would be too frightening to go from fragmentation into wholeness or from darkness into light. Jesus tells us too that prisoners who have been slaves for, a, for many, many years do not simply rise up as soon as the chains are taken off. Uh, their eyes are shut because they're so long accustomed to the darkness. And when the light comes, they don't simply just open their eyes. You know, it, it, it has to be a flickering of the eyelids opening. If you had a child that was having a night terror or a nightmare, and as a loving mother you went in and you tried to wake that child up while the child was in the middle of a nightmare, there's a good chance that the child would interpret that arm uh, shaking as a monster grabbing them from within the nightmare. In other words, when the mind's in fear, it cannot accept uh, a loving solution. We, that's why we need miracles, to start to open up gradually to be able to accept the love. And there's a great metaphor even in terms of going to a movie theater. If you go into a movie theater and you watch, we'll say, a two or three hour movie in the darkness, and then as soon as the movie's over, before the lights come on, if you just sprung out of the exit into the bright sunlight, it actually, your, your eyes are hurt because you go so fast, they've already adjusted to the darkness. And if you go out that exit door too fast, and right, the sun's right in your face, it actually hurts your eyes. Or sometimes people get that when they drink something cold too fast, they start to feel like they're getting a migraine <laughs> from having that, that extreme temperature change. It's too much change too fast, and it's painful. So this, the miracles are built in, and it will seem as if there are glimmers, or what seems to be partial uh, healings and partial transitions, just because that's the way the plan has to go. But in the end, we do have to stay open to the idea that no one's healed alone, that when I am healed, lesions upon lesions, basically the whole world will be healed when I'm completely healed. Because we're all one mind, that, that the whole world will be healed when we finally accept the atonement, or accept the true healing, which is not partial in any way. It has to be complete to be what it is. Yeah. Okay. You're welcome. I had another arm moment, just then. Oh, aha! There we go. Here we go. I don't know if we're going anywhere, but um, when you said um, about Jesus and the atonement, and um, yeah, it just um, I made it made me. It, I just felt I saw it in my mind. Um, our, all the all the minds joining together. It was wow. Yeah, it was the atonement. Jesus did it, and uh, it's beautiful. It's really amazing. I don't know that I actually really understand it or, or really comprehend it, but I know that I saw it, you know, and um, I haven't seen it before, so I'm happy. <laughs> thank, you, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, we had a couple back in the back over there, Peter. Right down, down here. Okay. <laughs> Hi, um, I, I just experienced a um, I guess not experience, uh, observed for the first time today, um, this morning, that uh, although um, my conscious day or my waking time during the day where, um, where I do uh, 
I do observe that I'm now in the ego world or shift from the ego world to the love world or the ego has sneaked in and and uh, consciously my day is becoming more and more loving and more and more accepting and um, but my dream world my dreams are still fearful dreams right my dream world is still uh, have incidents <coughs> which happen either in the past or still you know the fear is it's not a loving world so what dawned on me this morning was that because as I understand, dreams are nothing but jumbled up versions of your, your, your waking state, right? Whatever we see, observe during the daytime, the dreams are just made up of that only because it's just one mind. It's just now it's all kind of jumbled up, you know? You might see somebody in the dream, you will see the head of some person and, you know, it's all like that. So my question is, um, is that mean subconsciously there is still a lot of stuff still sitting there? of the fearful world which hasn't come up yet or I want to understand your experience where Francis said that you never had a sad day for 20 years is your dream world like that too or do you have fearful dreams still or will this dream world get also purified once your waking world gets purified that's my that's what dawned on me this morning I want to understand that we can talk about, uh, Jesus does tell us that, that all your time is spent in dreaming. So what we call our daytime daydreaming and our, our daily life and our nighttime dreams are all what Sigmund Freud called wish fulfillment. So as long as we have the ego still active, we could say, in the, in the unconscious mind, then our wish fulfillment will, will have aspects of fear in it until we go through a purification <clears throat> process. Jesus even says it's important to set your intention, your purpose for the day in the morning when you wake up and before you go to sleep. So he's even saying to give your dreams, your nighttime dreams, over to the Holy Spirit. And it, what you're describing is very common. A lot of people tell me that they'll say, oh, I've got a pretty good daily life, but at nighttime, oh, it's wild. I have wild dreams at night, or sometimes it's reversed, that they actually have wild, dramatic daytime <laughs> dreams, and it's peaceful yeah. at night. In other words, it's almost like the ego still is trying to find a haven, <laughs> a haven of peace somewhere. I'm going to do it here? No, I can't do it. I'm going to do it there. I'm going to you know, get my peace in, in one way, but then not in another. I, I would say that when you go through the purification process, things stabilize, so your dreams become much, much more stabilized, both we could say daytime and nighttime. Uh, I know when I first started going into the course and going into it after a number of years, I would have like teaching dreams. Before I started traveling around the world and speaking, I was doing it in my nighttime dreams, like Jesus was running like uh, when, it, when you're practicing for a theater, you know, dress rehearsal. <laughs> he was running a lot of dress rehearsal. I had some really good crowd, big crowds too, <laughs> in the uh, nighttime dreams. Well, this is good, look at all these people that are here. <laughs> and then I had my cat during the day, you know, <laughs> looking at me like, ha ha ha. But see, that's, the, they have, it has to, we have to be eased in. And it's even impo it's possible to have the, they were very instructional. Uh, or there were times where I would be asking questions before I went to sleep and then I would get dreams giving me insights and answers. So, they're wish fulfillment, but the Holy Spirit can use anything. And that's why you want to stay as open as possible to it being used. And, yeah, it's, have you had any experiences with dreams in your own life? No. No, nothing in particular. I guess that's exactly what you're saying. Normally I would ask the spirit to to show me if there's any information that somehow that I need to get with from the dream and ask him to, to bring it up. But that's just how it goes. Daytime and, and nighttime becomes unified in, in the purpose. Again, this like one thing that can be unified through our mind is the, the purpose and how we want to use them. What, what we're using them for. Um, if we're using them just for forgiveness all the time, then they become very 
similar in a way, like it doesn't really matter the image one way or the other, but if I can just use that for forgiveness, they become very, very similar, unified. Yeah. And also one related question again. So when I wake up, the very first thought is always thought of separation. <coughs> like when I wake up, the very first thought is not the world of love. It's, it's, I have to then do my mantra or chanting and get myself aligned with the Lord's thinking or God's thinking or loving world. But the very, when I just wake up, it's, I, I'm separate. Yeah? Yeah, it, you shouldn't be too shocked by that. Jesus says the ego always speaks first. Mm. Mm -hmm. right. So, you know, it's, it's impulsive, it's insane, it's full of rage, it's, you know, uh, I remember that Enya did this song called Wild Child, <laughs> and I, I always thought of the ego, but it was a kind of a song of like, of letting the wild child come up for healing, like let's, let's let it go through, let our mind go through this experience of healing, so it's, it's a very loving way to look at it, you shouldn't take that in a personal way, saying, hmm, is, our, is other people waking up? <laughs> with this thing in their mind, generally the ego speaks first and, and oftentimes it's like it goes through whatever it has to say and then you say, thank you for sharing. Thank yeah. You. Now we'll get on <laughs> with the day. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Hmm. My, uh, my question is about uh, some words that I'm hearing a lot of, and the words are handing over. Okay. <clears throat> One part of me says there's probably going to be a point where that's not a separate act, where it's just a continuous place. Okay. Um, but I'm also aware that uh, I don't see myself as there yet. So it seems to be a, something that I have to practice, this handing over. So my question is, can you talk a bit about handing over and also in the course Jesus says at a, at a particular point, your part is to return your thinking to the point at which the error was made and give it over to the atonement in peace. And I can see that this is a, this is a practice for me. Um, could you just expand on handing over in light of that statement from Jesus in the Course? Yeah, the, there is a part in the Rules for Decision which is part of training the mind to make decisions with the Holy Spirit instead of trying to make them against, um, against God. Where Jesus says, your one remaining problem is that you still believe you can run some aspects of your own life. And that's pointing to the workbook and the transfer of training. You know, as best you can, one of the two guidelines is try not to make exceptions to the idea of the day. And so, this is a journey of unwinding it and letting go of control around decision making. You know, those are the, the first two steps and rules for decision. Decide the kind of day that you want and say to yourself, if I make no decisions by myself, this is the day that will be given me. Say a peaceful day, a harmonious day, joyful day, happy day. If I make no decisions by myself, meaning egoically, this is the day that will be given me. So, you're right, it's a surrender process. We do oftentimes call it handing, handing it over. What does handing it over really mean? Well, while the mind's fragmented, it, it has to desire the purpose of the Holy Spirit, desire forgiveness, and then one of the prayers that I particularly liked from the Course of Miracles was, miracles was Holy Spirit, decide for God for me. I like the way that prayer works. 
I like that feeling. Holy Spirit, decide for God, for me. And what that is, is, is instead of like looking at a situation and already judging against the, a situation as, oh, this is fearful, or oh, not again, or, you know, typically the mind already decides and judges, is to start to develop having an openness of, hmm, I, I'll, I shall see, or show me, or lead me, or guide me. You see that open quality. Because if you already judged the situation, then you need help. And you need to kind of come back, wind it back. And uh, what, what Sanji was talking about, that prayer, uh, I'm here to be truly helpful, that was a, a very practical way that I practiced handing it, handing it over, like you're saying. Because I, I thought, I have to practice this, it's, I'm never going to make this a habit, uh, get into the habit of it, unless I practice it. So, the way it was, Jesus said, every time you walk through a doorway, whether you're going through your grandmother's apartment door, a grocery store, a laundromat, you're going to a course group in a, somebody's house, and you have to go down, you have to go through the door of the houseway, pause for a second before you go through any doorway, Jesus said, and quietly to yourself, go through the prayer. I am here only to be truly helpful. I am here to represent Him who sent me. It was a way of orienting my mind into that, oh, hand it over. Come back, oh, what, what is this really for? Instead of all the typical agendas. You know, when you walk through a grocery store door, usually you've got a pretty strong grocery store agenda going on in there. You're going to get in there, you're going to get out as fast as possible, you're going to read some ingredients and and look at some prices and make, you know, there's a grocery store agenda and you're not thinking, I'm here only to be truly helpful. I'm going to have holy encounters and, oh, how many miracles will I share at this grocery store? Usually there's an agenda about getting in and getting out and not spending more than how much money you've got, and all those kind of things, and those interfere with the miracles, because Jesus has a whole different purpose for that grocery store excursion, of a completely different one. He wants it to be for just ex being a miracle worker, and the ego is saying, oh no, no. And Jesus would tell me, listen, the groceries are going to get purchased, don't be so concerned, you'll, you'll get the groceries, but we're going to have some joy here, we're going to have some glee, <laughs> you know, we're going to extend some love and some miracles here, and I was amazed. Even when I would, back in the days of fitness centers, you know, you go in to lift weights or get on the treadmill and everything, I had, there was a total ego agenda for, you know, cardiovascular fitness and how long on the machines and this and this, and, and then when I started to go in there with Jesus, he just took over. I was on the treadmill having these wonderful deep talks with the, the one that was next to me, lifting weights, and you're, you're, you're relaxing, you're using it more as a meditation than thinking, how many of these do I have to do, and how more muscular will I be, you know. Jesus basically, uh, if it would be like in Australian rules of football, it's like an interception. He intercepted. <laughs> the ego's agenda, and started running with the ball the other way. <laughs> it's football, it's like, it's picked off, it's intercepted, you know, it was a, he intercepted the purpose for whatever I thought I was doing, and he said, no, there's a higher purpose here. For you to be happy, we have to go with the higher plan. So, yeah, I think that's, it's very practical. That way, very yeah, practical. I really like it because a lot of the times we remember to hand over when we get an upset, when like there is some stuff that's already bubbling up and the emotion that we cannot handle, then we start to say, how do I hand it over? But Jesus also says in the Course that I cannot take your fear away because that interferes the direct cause and effect relationship. The fear is only there because there is a desire for the ego and because of that desire, because of that thought, fear is the consequence. 
of those thoughts, of those ego desires. So what we are really handing over is not holding on to an ego desire and ego thoughts and beliefs and hoping the result will be different or the effect will be different. What David was just saying was what we are handing over is a cause, meaning that every time we're making a decision, it's always reflecting a desire because when we go to the supermarket, when we go to anywhere, where, when we meet a person, there, we are on a autopilot. The ego always has a way of telling us, yeah, yeah, you go there to get this. You go there to, to make sure that you get this. So there is an underlying ego agenda that we already, it's already become like the ground. We don't even see them anymore. We're just operating on this autopilot. And if we don't get what we want, then the expectation kick in and then the upset, the, the emotion started to arise and we were thinking, what's wrong? But when we hand it over, that's why we talk so much about guidance because the guidance is a process we start to let the spirit in before all of that. Make the decision for me. Allow me to be truly helpful. That is a reversal of the original intention of why we're doing anything. You know, we hand it over of the ego purpose of doing anything to the spirit. Our mind is reversed to say, I'm here only to be truly helpful. I'm here only to represent you. You tell me what I'm here for. And Jesus saying, great, with that desire for me and me only, then we're gonna have a lot of joy. You know, because that's the inevitable consequence of desiring the spirit and desiring the, the, the thoughts from the spirit. So that is the handover, the handing over. There's so many, we have so many movies uh, just on and on that basically are basically saying, like, that you have to hand over the purpose. Like, that we have a movie called Mr. Destiny where he has to have a moment of surrender, where there's literally a light that comes over him when he gives up and surrenders his agenda. And then every, he gets out of the, the loop of, of struggle. Groundhog Day, Bill Murray, classic one. He keeps repeating the same day, the same mistakes, over and over and over. Until he finally starts to open up to being truly helpful. You know, he's, he starts to help and help, and then He's so surprised when he gets out of the time loop, you know, and, and he's with Rita and he says, something's different. And suddenly it's different. We have so many movies in our Movie Watcher's Guide to Enlightenment that are about that shift. Where you start to see, sometimes in extreme ways, that, that there's a loop going on. The Truman Show, you know, he's looping, he's looping, he keeps looping and looping and finally He's determined to escape. He finally makes it to the exit door and, and goes out of the controlled world of the ego. He's able to go beyond with and Sylvia, who's praying for his release. You know, he goes and he's there with her. So that's really what we're, we're that's why those movies are so powerful is, like Francis was saying, sometimes the loop becomes so much a part of your experience that you don't even see them as loops anymore until you get disillusioned and you start to feel like why am I doing re repeating the same mistakes and that there's got to be a better way yeah. Yeah. David, I've been um, writing in a journal since I saw you at Easter in Pimble and I've been reading it back and I'm seeing the same, the same stuff come up over and over and over again and I hadn't noticed as I was writing, but reading it back, I can see the patterns. Mm -hmm. So I think, my goodness, it is Groundhog Day. I can see this loop going on, which has been very interesting for me to see what's in my mind that I'm not healing. I'm just going through it over and over. Yeah. Mm. Hi, um, David and Francis. Uh, I, was, I was just thinking about the, the ego and the ego thought system. So, if you think that the thought system is built on 
sin, the fear and guilt and punishment. And there's so many other things proliferate from that. So is that the ego? Is that just a thought system? Or we kind of personify ego as well. It appears that if he came from the heaven and created this thought system of separation, and it's a system. And at, at the, if you, I, I was thinking of, of your circles. It's a very really nice picture of the, you know, emo, surface and the emotions and the feeling, be, beliefs and so on. So is the ego the whole thought system? I was thinking where this thing comes from, like, you know, if we, we talk about anxiety and all that. So is that the particular kind of entity or is it just a thought system? And where does the sting come, sting come from, comes from? Is it at the root of like a desire, or at the very end of it? Is that the desire is the ego kind of, how did we create the ego? That, that's what the Course says, we created it. And then say ego is the thought system. So are they, can you clarify a bit on, on that thing? Because that's where everything kind of emanates from, yeah, all these emotions yeah. and everything. You mean where does the ego come from? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we created the ego, and this ego is cunning, and ego is that, ego is that, like bloodthirsty and so on. And we kind of see that we are personifying that as well when we have anger and so on. So I guess that we, all these emotions have energy, right? So all this energy summed up, is that the ego? Is that what we call ego that we created? Or is it something else, kind of a, a one ego with all these attributes? Kind of been I don't know. I'm just yeah. It, the, that's a, a core metaphysical question in the sense that, you know, when someone says we created the ego, no, that's not the case. The ego, the ego was never created. Right. So, basically, what does that mean? Well, creation is 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 of spirit. God creates. Christ creates. Creation is spirit. Creation is eternal. Um, even when people start talking about the soul in terms of an individual soul, like seven, everybody's got their own individual soul. Did, did God create the seven, seven billion souls? Seven billion specks of eternity? Or are these souls learning things? They don't seem to be eternal. They seem to be bound in incarnating and reincarnating. Yeah, creation, the way Jesus uses it, is always purely spirit, love and light. It has nothing to do with, with form. And the interesting thing about the ego is it, it wasn't created and it doesn't have a parent. It's, it's like a bastard child. It has no... <laughs> it, it doesn't have a parent. That's why it's a wild child. Why is the ego impulsive? It doesn't come from stability. It doesn't come from sanity. It is a fabrication. It is an invention. You know, when you read a novel people will say, is the novel fiction? Or is it based on actual events? The ego is fiction. It's complete fiction. Fabrication. Even in the workbook, Jesus, as, he, as you're going through the unwinding, he will, he never says, uh, there's no workbook lesson that says, I created the world I see. It's, I have invented the world I see. You see the word he's using? Invention. He would never put the word creation there, and he never puts creation in front of the ego. In fact, as you get back towards the teacher's manual, um, where is the ego where the darkness was? Notice the past tense. What is the ego? Nothing. Where can you find the ego? It cannot be found. You know, he's basically saying, the light has come. That's another one of his workbook lessons. The light has come. Well, what does the Bible say about light and darkness and love and fear? Perfect love casts out fear. When the light has come, the darkness is gone. How can you define the ego if, if there's only light? You see, he's, he's, he's raising it up and saying, well, you believe in it, so I have to use words that describe it. It's a thought system, it's a belief system. He says, 
And he said, you made the ego. He doesn't say you created the ego, he said you made the ego by believing in it. And you can dispel it by withdrawing your belief from it. Isn't that helpful? Hmm. It's like, uh, uh, in the Wizard of Oz, you know, Dorothy, the lion, the tin man, the, the whole group of them in, the, in Oz are, when they finally come to see the wizard, they finally get in to see the wizard, they're very frightened. Because there's this big face with this big forehead, it's massive and it's got this loud voice, kind of commanding and demanding voice. And they're shaking, their knees are shaking. And basically they, they see it as an actual entity. Actually, later in the movie though, when they go there, and they're still shaking, because it's telling them you got to go and get the witches, you have to do all these things, and they're all frightened, until the little dog, Toto, goes over and he pulls the curtain, and this big face and this loud thing is this man who's, who's magnifying his voice and is pulling all these levers to get the illusion of this big, bad, scary thing. And he's, he's talking and, he, and he's trying to grab the curtain and pull the curtain back to cover himself and hide again. And he's, he's grabbing the microphone and saying, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. <laughs> you see, he doesn't want to see it's just this little man. Because they're not going to be frightened of this little man. They're frightened of this big thing with this big voice. That's exactly, it's the ego is a tiny puff of nothing, but it's used the power of the mind to, to make up this whole cosmos, this whole giant cosmic mask. You know, they said that Adam and Eve, when Adam and Eve found that they were naked, they, they grabbed fig leaf to cover their private parts. And I would say that the ego is using the entire cosmos as a cosmic fig leaf. <laughs> it's using all of time and space to cover its private, its belief in private minds and private thoughts. Yeah, never heard it that way. Thank you, Jesus. That's quite, that's quite graphic. You're giving us like a, a sexual reference that we'll remember. <laughs> a cosmic fig leaf to cover a puff of nothingness, a tiny puff of nothingness. You see, to, to make it seem like it's much worse than it really is. And also you're asking, is it, is it connected to the world? Yeah, that's where the movie The Matrix come in. The, the Matrix is all around you. You know, when you pay your taxes, when you help your neighbor carry out their garbage, you know, when, you know, when you go to church, everything we seem to do as human beings is part of the matrix. And who invented the matrix? The ego. So all, Shakespeare called it, much to do about nothing. <laughs> he was on to it. It is much to do about nothing because it's the ego's world. Linear time-space world. There's this presence of love, the spirit in us, who's, who's calling to us saying, don't get, don't get caught in all of that, because you'll never be happy in all of that. And so the ego is this little puff and it's the entire generated world that we, a lot of spiritualities and religions call God created, like God created the world and God created the people and the animals. God is a heavenly creator and the world is a projection of this tiny puff and it's ideas leave not their source. The world is still part of the ego until we forgive it. Everything that we perceive in this world is part of the ego system. So the, the, the fear was before the ego and then fear was fear was the ego. It's one with the ego. The one. fear and the ego are, are synonymous. And the world and the ego are synonymous. Yes. It's, it's all around. We can't we can't say, oh, that tyrant over there, oh, that dictator over there, oh, there's a terrorist over there. The ego is laughing because it's 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 beyond personifying it and saying the devil. You know, the devil gets blamed for a lot of things. Uh, I used to when I was growing up, I, there was a comedian called Flip Wilson 
And he used to dress up, this man, Flip Wilson, dressed up as a woman. He put on this funny hair, he put on lipstick and makeup. And his favorite saying was, the devil made me buy this dress. That was one of his albums. The devil made me buy this dress. The devil is to blame. You see, then you can blame the devil. And the ego is so clever, now it's, it's invented a character with a pitchfork. Or Lucifer, an angel that... You see how it's always going to try to make a character that's to blame. And actually we have to face that belief, that thought system in our mind and, and release it, you know, to, to truly be free. Okay, we've got, a, we've got a couple questions. Did you have a question too? I saw your hand up earlier too. Hmm? We're winding up, okay. Do you have a question or a comment? Comment, I just called to mind, I had a terrible fear of the dark as a child, and after struggling with it, and the associated insomnia and terror that went with it for many years, when I was 12 years old, I decided this is the day I stop being afraid of, of what I know is not there. And I had peace from that day forward. But it was just taking that bold, big, brave leap of faith that I'm just going to refuse to believe in it. Logic did not prevail. Thinking about it did not work. All the cognitive steps, you know, checking there was nothing in the cupboard and under the bed and locking the doors, no, nothing worked. Logic did not prevail. It was irrational. And I just had to draw a line in the sand and say, tonight's the night. I refuse to believe in that. And it went in an instant. It's great. It's, it's, that's a, a snapshot of, of when I think of Jesus in the 40 days in the desert where the devil is offering Jesus the whole world. You can have this, you can have this, you can have anything. And he goes, no thanks. I want God. <laughs> I'm not interested in your world. And then... You know, even the apostles, they want to be be part of, they thought Jesus was rule like a ruler, like a king does. They wanted to be part of his earthly kingdom, and there was no earthly kingdom to be part of. You know, it was, he kept talking about the Father in heaven, the Father in heaven. Why do you call me good? The Father in heaven is good. Everything was about the Father in heaven, and there was such happiness with that idea. So that's... Great. In, in that circumstance, you know, fear of the dark, you basically just said, it stops here. Yeah. And uh, we have have met a lot of people that have had those moments in their life where, where there's some kind of temptation that rises up that has been there long, and they just kind of look at it and say, oh, it's you again. Mm -hmm. No, it stops here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not going there. Yeah. Beautiful. Okay, back in the back. Well, I, had, I was going to say something, but now I've got something totally different, and um, I had a big trigger just before. I remember at the conference I was ignored, and then uh, once again ignored here, and, and, and all of a sudden these tears came up, and I've gone, whoa, okay. So I went out and had a big blubber and had a bit of a think about what that was. T took me totally by surprise, and it was about the fact that I was never heard as a kid. I, I wasn't allowed to speak. Um, I wasn't important enough and, uh, and I've ended up a singer and it's really odd <laughs> it's a strange thing so um, yeah that came up and I hopefully just released that so that was all but what I actually wanted to say was <laughs> that my girlfriend's just had a double lung transplant and she had emphysema and she's like, <gasps> like this breathing really badly and when she had the double lung transplant She's still breathing badly, and that was a reflection on what you were talking about before, about how you have to train your mind. It takes time, and you can't just, like all of a sudden, she can't just, and it fascinated me, because it showed me the power of the mind, and here she is with brand new lungs from a young person, and she's still breathing like that. So, anyway, that's it. Yeah, it's a good example about how we can't change the form and expect a different thing. Yeah, yeah. We have to do the inner work. Yeah, it's beautiful. Thank you.